Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. Did you say, while in the recruiting station, at any time during those years, that when you see a nigger driving with a white woman, you pull them over? No. Do you recall anyone asking you, if you didn't have a reason to pull them over, what would you do? I don't recall anybody ever asking me that question, sir. Did you ever make the statement that if you needed a reason, you would find one? No. Okay. Next paragraph. Did you say at any time in that recruiting station, in the presence of any female, including Kathleen Bell, that you'd like nothing more than to see all niggers gathered together and killed? No. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy, what it is, how it works. Uh, We are so excited. Our broadcast for today, we've been talking about the O.J. Simpson case. We've been reading Jeffrey Tubin's bestseller, The Run of His Life, which is based on the FX series and... Uh, he was a consultant for that series as well. It has been, wow, what an experience. I will confess, I've said it uh, very humbly as someone who believed all of my life, of course, O.J. Simpson was guilty. Uh, guilty. Of course, uh, he killed those people and all the rest for all of my life, even though I didn't watch the trial and never invested any time to research until Right now, and within, I think, a few weeks, I had pretty comfortably concluded, like, wow, I have been wrong all these years, and shame on me for not even taking the time for doing some research. Uh, We are so uh, excited today for our broadcast to be able to have. He is labeled the architect of the defense team and, in fact, has a book that is set to come out. I'm excited to add that to my library after we can finish with old Mr. Tubin's work, Uh, The Truth About the O.J. Simpson Trial by the Architect of the defense. Uh, Even before the O.J. Simpson trial, he was super well known. His work with the Boston Strangler case and Patty Hearst and Dr. Sam Shepard. But Mr. O.J. Simpson seems to have eclipsed all of that. We're so excited. Our guest for this evening, Mr. F. Lee Bailey. Mr. Bailey, you with us, sir? I am. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of your Wednesday evening. We're so excited and looking forward to talking about the uh, 1994 trial with Mr. Simpson. Uh, I heard uh, one exchange, sir, where you were talking about this case and you said that you were familiar, were ready for Mark Furman because of your time in the military. And you said you'd been around white people who use the same type of language, talk the same type of way. Can you talk about some of the racism that you experienced your time in the military? Well, I went to the military in 1952 to become a naval jet pilot. And this was just before the Supreme Court decided that all of us were equal once again. In Brown against the Board of Education, I lived in North Carolina, and the upheaval that that caused among what I call the white rednecks of the surrounding neighborhood was very substantial. And people were just shocked that they were going to have to treat their African-American co-citizens as human beings. And I I was taken aback by that. I'm, I'm pleased to say I now live in Georgia many, many years later, and that it's not eclipsed, but it's turned around a lot. Wow. What? So I guess were they, when you were in the military specifically, where were you stationed when you were in the military, sir? Well, I was in Cherry Point, North Carolina, but I lived uh, in a seaside community 20 miles off the base simply because I didn't want to be 
locked into that culture to the point where I was unaware of what was going on in the civilian world outside. And I enjoyed it very thoroughly, had a good time. But there isn't any question but what black people were secondhand citizens hmm. in 1955, 54, 5, and 6 when I lived there. And I hadn't seen a lot of that in my life. But once I moved below the Mason-Dixon line, where most military bases are located, uh, I saw far too much. Wow. This would be like the middle of mass resistance, I think, as it was called, where you have lots of white people in like Virginia, North Carolina, even closing down schools in response to Brown v. Board of Education for folks listening in. So just to kind of put all this in historical context, uh, might even come back to the Brown decision later on. Uh, I guess with that as background, so, wow, 40 years after that experience and then going into the O.J. Simpson trial, after it's done and you win the acquittal, I've heard numerous times where you said you've heard white people who have scolded you, I guess, for the past 25 years and said, basically, you prostituted yourself to acquit that nigger. Is that true? No, it wasn't the words exactly, and I'm sorry to say I've heard it coming from fellow uh, lawyers and a couple of judges, and I won't tell you what part of the country they're from. Wow. <laughs> wow. Have you been, I guess you could tell me if it's a, a accurate term, have you been punished, uh, castigated for, because I mean, you've defended lots of folks over your illustrious career. Have you been castigated in this manner for any other case? Um, yes. But not like this. Um, when I represented the Strangler, who in fact killed 13 women and made no bones about it, I was never unpopular, although the state police did have to throw up a protective uh, group one night when a guy got drunk and brandished an old Colt 44 and said he was going to have to kill me because I was across the street in the courthouse trying to get the strangler loose again. And he was sure I would do it because I always win my cases. So he was reluctantly going to have to sacrifice himself and blow me away. Kind of like Mr. Trump says he could do on Fifth Avenue and get away with. Apart from that, I have not been badly mistreated for representing some people that were unconscionably sick evil. I mean, all over the spectrum. One of the nicest guys I ever met in my life. Affable, um, I think straightforward and so forth, is O.J. Simpson. And I have people walk up to me and say, well, you know, I know he's guilty. And I said, well, if you're a witness, you really kept quiet about it for a lot of years. <laughs> and if you're not, you'll probably fall crap. Well, then they say, well, how could you talk to me like that? It is very simple. Ignorance is always repugnant. F. Lee Bailey, context of white supremacy. I was one of those folks for a long, long time. Of course he's guilty. Of course he's guilty. He had to kill those people. Uh, why is it, before I get to one of the more critical pieces as to why maybe he didn't do it after all, why is it exactly, do you think, the acquittal of O.J. Simpson, why do you think that upset so many white people so intensely and for so many years now, 25 years? Well, uh, for two reasons. First of all, O.J. certainly didn't have it in mind, but when he made that trip to the cemetery to his wife's grave with a pistol talking about blowing his brains out, he really was the sponge. I don't think gave much of a damn about anything else except that he was totally ruined for life. I think people took that trip as an indication of guilt. Much more important, throughout the trial, in the face of a stark deficiency of evidence, the press, most of which was of a low quality, some exceptions, but most of it of a low quality. And I can't miss the tube in that who frankly doesn't know beans about criminal cases 
and shouldn't be writing books about them. But I saw him there during the trial and we put up with him. And uh, uh, it, it's just a shame that the press became convinced that there was a mountain of blood evidence. There wasn't even a molecule that there was this and that and so forth. When I confront people like you used to be, if I may quote Clint Eastwood, who said, I ain't that way anymore, uh, as William Money and the Unforgiven, but who used to be convinced that he was guilty, the quickest way to bring him up short is to say, okay, what evidence do you depend on to reach that conclusion? And most of them get in the deep water or even mud very quickly. But what bothers me is people don't seem to care whether or not they have any facts in mind. They just know the media said he was guilty. He was going to be convicted. Nobody would listen to me. I said there isn't a chance in the world this jury is going to hook him until the day the jury in 53 minutes after nine months of trial decided there wasn't a case there. So America, as we're seeing happen right now at the very highest level of government, doesn't like to be told it can't have what it wants. And it wanted a conviction, it expected a conviction, and the fact that the jury didn't give it a conviction has just been kind of wildly ignored. Oh, wow. I feel like there, there are court cases that bother people that happen pretty regularly uh, where people feel like, eh, I don't know, maybe the jury didn't get this one right or maybe even the grant, maybe it doesn't even get the trial and people are upset about that. But this one, and with white people particularly, like what is it exactly that you think pricks white people so much about this, the acquittal of O.J. Simpson? Number one, they expected a conviction. Hmm. And like the kid who's disappointed at Christmas because he didn't get a BB gun, as in the Christmas story. Um, Americans are not a terribly mature bunch. They pout like little kids sometimes when they don't get what they want, particularly when it's an area offbeat. In other words, nobody with an opinion on the O.J. Simpson case, pro or con, is going to get punished for it. Now, I get punished for it. Plenty. Uh, the bar came after me. The IRS came after me. Uh, it was an avalanche. And the fact that I am still standing at age 87 with a big iron on my hip for any jerk that wants to go through my gun sights is, I guess, a, an extraordinary exception. I must tell you, I enjoy the hell out of it. <laughs> right on. Well, let me... If I could push back, what would your response be to folks who say, hey, there were lots of folks on Mr. Simpson's defense team, uh, Barry Sheck, uh, the late Johnny L. Cochran Jr., Robert Shapiro, uh, Peter Neufeld, uh, Alan Dershowitz, uh, that none of these other folks were punished per se? How is it that they escaped the, the wrath of also helping to get Mr. Simpson off? Well, I think one of the myths, I have an absolute professional duty to shatter right at the outset is that this was a dream team. And number one, I have never been on a dream team, but that's not too surprising since I've never been on any team except this one. I was always lead counsel, um, shouldering the heavy cross and um, decisions to be made. And that's the way I lived. Like any pilot, you depend on your own judgment. And I enjoyed that. I was not sure Johnny Cochran and I wouldn't be oil and water for completely uh, benign reasons. And when it became clear that he was going to take over the case, I sat down with him. I said, look, Johnny, I was worried a lot about OJ until you came along. You're a good lawyer. Uh, I think he's in good hands. If you just be happy if I backed off. I'll go and see if OJ will agree to it. And he said, not on your life. I want you to stay on the team. The dream pretty much ends with Johnny Cochran, except, of course, and I will confess that he's been my friend for longer than either of us care to remember. Alan Dershowitz is always 
a class act. He's a brilliant man. I started using him to help me on brief when he was 28, the youngest professor at Harvard Law in the history of the school. And to this day, he remains a good guy. Uh, Czech and Neufeld, they were DNA specialists. They were good at what they did. Uh, when you bring a New York lawyer into any other courtroom, you've got an experience coming. They play rough and tumble there. I used to call them the gangsters from New York. But I'd hire them again. Uh, Robert Shapiro, I wouldn't hire him for a traffic case. And nobody else on the defense team really had any input that carried any weight, certainly toward the final result. I mean, Gus, you've got to get one thing right through your head. This was a case about a glove. There was no link whatsoever to O.J. Simpson, the murders, except the glove. And in order to accept the glove as evidence against O.J., you had to believe Mark Perman. And I can't imagine asking a yellow cur dog to believe Mark Perman under any circumstances. So the linkage was somewhere between frail and ridiculous. Take out Furman and the glove, and the case has to be dismissed for lack of any ties whatsoever. Because the first element in the defense of any criminal case is opportunity. From there, we go to motive and other factors if you don't have opportunity, you don't have a case. And OJ, quite apart from the glove, because it was found with wet blood, damp blood, still shiny, that eliminated OJ because it meant the glove had not been out in the air for at least two hours. And OJ had been out of Los Angeles when the glove was found by six hours and was sitting in Chicago. So there are barriers everywhere to his having done it. There is not one plausible theory of guilt. And I think I've heard them all. And if I haven't, my chief investigator, Pat McKenna, who really is the architect of this case in many ways, between us, we have heard them all. I have not heard a theory that is even plausible and certainly not one that is sound whereby you could say the evidence points at O.J. There's no reason in the world for this guy who had all the women in the world was perfectly happy with his relationship with his former wife, uh, loved all four of his kids. No reason in the world for him to slaughter his wife in the front yard under bright lights with the dogs barking and the kids could easily have been looking out the window. People just don't stop and think before they trumpet, as apparently you, you have confessed to doing. I know he did it. You don't know anything if you think you know he did it. Context of white supremacy, F. Lee Bailey. I, did, I just learned that bit of information that, oh, wait a minute. His children were at home when this happened? I hadn't. And even since I just learned that information, I've been asking other people. And... I'd say almost, I think it's more than 75% of the folks that I've asked thus far, they didn't know that either, that his children were at home. Just can, Mr. Bailey, if you could speak to the timeline, because that's another component that I had no idea just, if if we talk yeah, about I, when, I know, but, yes, sir. But, but Gus, I want to sweeten the pot a little bit on the children. Okay. Uh, on the afternoon of the recital, of Sidney Simpson, the younger daughter, which O.J. attended with the family. The family went on to the Mezzaluna restaurant, not far from Nicole's house on Bundy, to have dinner. And O.J. dropped by, didn't get invited to have dinner, so he went off and had a hamburger with Cato Kalen and tried to find a girlfriend to play with before they limousine arrived. However, O.J. was introduced at the dinner to a friend of his daughter's named Rachel. 
Rachel, he was told, was staying overnight. He did not learn that later that evening without much notice, her father had picked her up and taken her home a little before 10 o'clock. So if O.J. was going to kill his wife in the presence of his two children, he had every reason to think that his neighbor, six-year-old or whatever, Rachel would be looking out the window too and be another witness to the crime. Now, to shift to your question, the timeline, the timeline walked him out of there because nobody can be in two places at once. That's what we assume when we open the trial, the case. And so far, we haven't seen that rule fractured by anyone, although cases with identical twin defendants can be disconcerting. Quite apart from that, these murders happened about 10.34 p.m. on June 12, 1994. O.J. was at his front door with his golf clubs and luggage at 10.55 p.m. He lived six miles away. Within that 20-minute period, he had to slaughter his wife catch Ron Goldman arriving totally by accident to return the wife's mother's glasses, which had been left in the Mezzaluna where he was a waiter. He got stabbed about 19 times, put up a fight. The killer probably had defensive wounds. The killer then left the scene for a vehicle which probably was parked on Gretna Green. They Street directly behind Nicole's condominium. And then the killer realized he'd forgotten something. And the bloody footprints show that one set of Bruno Magui shoes left the scene, then came back, then left again. Now, in whatever minutes might be left, OJ has got to hide all of the clothing, all of the weapons, how many there might have been, we think maybe two, certainly one knife, clean up, which with blood is very difficult to do, clean up the Bronco, because he's going to be covered with blood when he hops in it to drive it, and it just doesn't work. And the jury very quickly concluded that no matter how you turn this kaleidoscopic case, you always come out with the same deficiency. There wasn't time. So a timeline is an alibi put together by pieces, but probably the strongest defense known to the criminal law. And thank God we had it because the rampant prejudice that was out there against OJ, I did not correctly fathom. I mean, our jury wasn't subject to it. I don't think they ever felt it. I don't think race played any role whatsoever in the case, except they concluded that Mark Furman was a racist more than willing to lie. And that was the only string that held the bag together. What, what's your response uh, for folks who say, hey, the prosecution, they had witnesses who say they heard dogs barking closer to 1015. So this could have maybe happened earlier than 1030, 1040, uh, which would have given him, Mr. Simpson, a little bit more time to commit these murders. Well, I would have to say to that group of ignorant people, you don't do your homework, which is probably causes half the trouble in America and on the planet. If you've done your homework, you'd find out there was one witness Pablo Fenders, who thought dogs began to bark around 10.15, was not sure, but the senior detective on the case, Tom Lang, with an E, because there was a witness named Tom Lang, the only difference was the detective had an E on it, in his book, he and fellow chief detective on the case, Philip Van Adder, concluded that they should not have tried to put forward with no corroboration Pablo Fenders for a 1015 murder when the evidence was overwhelming that 1034 was correct. Now, 
these two birds did not go on to explain. If that were so, how in the world they could have been entitled to a conviction, but it's in their book, and in my book, um, which right now is simply the truth about the Simpson case, I will put each of them in their place using, as I did with Mark Furman and his tapes, their own words to bury them. Wow. With uh, Mark Furman, and that's so important with the timeline because that's just that's just logic. There are lots of witnesses about when they heard this, what time that this happened, like just u- using logic. Do we really think there's enough time to kill two able-bodied adults by yourself, clean up, dispose of the knife so that it can never be found of, and bloody shoes, bloody clothing never be discovered and then show up, bang, be ready to hop in the limo at 1055 and be affable, chatty, not bloody. Is that possible? I'd say pretty handily. Well, there's one additional, one additional fact, Gus, which is, I think, interesting. Uh, OJ, <laughs> always a glutton for the ladies, and I'm not criticizing him. I'm just saying that's the way OJ was, and he had lots of... Uh, um, people in his OJ fan club. Um, <clears throat> he was trying to call Paula Barbieri, who was his current squeeze, at 10 12 p.m. <clears throat> or 10 03. There were two phone calls. Mm. But they're right in that area. Now, is the guy who was ready to murder someone a few minutes later? calling his girlfriend to see if he can snuggle up with her before he gets on the airplane. Of course, unbeknownst to him at the time, she was in Las Vegas spending the night with uh, Michael Bolton. And I think that her book, which just came out, probably recites that fact. It was never an issue. But that's the last phone call O.J. made on his phone before he went to Chicago. And you don't normally call a girlfriend to try to uh, get chummy and then 10, 12 minutes later go in emergency uh, rage without some kind of provocation. There was no evidence of any provocation here. OJ's at the Benjamin Luna restaurant. OJ's with Kevin at the Burger King. And OJ's getting in a limousine. All completely relaxed unremarkable events. Mm. I would agree. Even even without the phone call, I tend to think just going to McDonald's doesn't exactly strike me as the preface to homicide, but, you know, I was wrong all these years, so I'm, that, I'm still learning. I'm going to read your book and keep reading. Uh, speaking, everybody wrote a book here, including Mr. Furman, uh, and you... <laughs> The whitewashing of Mark Furman has been extraordinary over the last 25 years, like in just researching the case and learning like, wow, the only person who was convicted related to the criminal case, the people of O.J. Simpson, is Mark Furman. <laughs> like he's the only person mm-hmm. and he's got like a and totally. I, 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 think, I think a good slug of credit for that. <clears throat> Gus, because in my career, which now goes back to 1954, when I first stepped into a courtroom to try a case as chief counsel as a shaved tail Marine lieutenant, age 21. Um, there are a few things in the world I have ever done of which I am as proud as dismantling that SOB in front of the world and letting some white people see what a racist cop in Los Angeles looks like. It, I can only conclude it's, at least my perspective, it seems that way more white people are upset with O.J. Simpson than Mark Furman. Like, the New York Times, they had that big piece that came out in 1996. So this is a year after conviction, behind the badge. And they say... The public image of Mr. Furman is simplistic. 
federal, state, and local investigators are beginning to conclude there is little evidence Mr. Furman committed the criminal acts of violence and misconduct he boasted about on the notorious tapes he made with a screenwriter and interviews with more than 40 of Mr. Furman's colleagues, friends, and critics, as well as a review of confidential police documents, suggest that many of the lurid stories the detective recounted on the tapes were simply braggadocia by an egotistical but troubled man. In the end, those closest to Mr. Furman say the trial of the century may have crumbled in part because of one man's fantasy life and because prosecutors ignored warning signs about Mr. Furman. They finished just saying, oh, speaking of Clint Eastwood, the last part they say, but as the emotions of the trial fade, the portrait that is emerging of Mark Furman is that of a complex, paradoxical man. He could spew racist invective, yet he counted blacks among his close friends. He boasted of violent exploits as a Marine in Vietnam, yet the closest he got to the ground was war there was aboard a ship in south china sea he cultivated a reputation as a macho officer in the clint eastwood dirty hairy mold yet his true ambition was to be an artist and he was sometimes complimented by suspects for treating them with courtesy like i don't think we we think of mark Furman as some spewing racist i think there's been this kind of oh we just got it all wrong. He made all that stuff up, and he didn't even mean what he said on the tapes. What do you make of this? Well, I think the New York Times, which can be a venerable newspaper, I've tilted with them and been covered by them for 60 years, really blew it. I mean, obviously, the author that they assigned to this story had a whitewash investigation. What the hell are the LAPD going to say? All these stories are true and they never prosecuted anyone for it? No. It's it's like we got a couple of senators running for a Senate here in Georgia which will tilt the balance of power for the next four years. If both Democrats get in, it's a, it's a barely uh, Democratic controlled Washington at the Senate level. If one of them doesn't get in, they've got 51 to 49. It could be a mess. But both of the Democrat and Republican senators heard about the coronavirus based on confidential data, dumped their stock while the ignorant public held on to its and saved a lot of money. Now, that, that's a felony. Insider trading is a felony, and people go to jail for it every year. Yet these people say, oh, we've been cleared by our ethics people. Who are the ethics people? Senators who are Republicans. And the fact that Mark Furman was investigated as to these incidents is absolute BS. Do you think for one minute, if the LAPD, with its miserable record, of human rights ignorance emblazoned in the Rodney King case, but still present in OJ's case. Do you think for one minute if they found out that true that Berman's stories were true, would publish that fact and admit it that their cops were even allowed to talk this way? Bear in mind, after Furman was diagnosed by their psychiatrist and psychologist as a malingerer, a liar, a vicious SOB, and some other bad things. Because they were looking for a pension at age 36. They denied the pension and promoted him to detective. If ever there was a sick organization, it was the LAPD that endorsed that promotion. Do you think the the evidence suggests that Mr. Furman did plant that glove at O.J. Simpson's property? I think the evidence, if you look at it objectively, is almost overwhelming. First, apply some logic. As you said, you've been good enough to do lately in the Simpson case, and I herald your decision. The logic says that that glove did not walk from Bundy to Rockingham, where O.J. lived. Logic also says that it didn't fly there. Somebody moved it since there's no question 
that it was once a part of the murder scene and a match with a left-handed glove, which was found there. So, if somebody put it there, who might have done it? Well, O.J. might have done it, except that he couldn't. For this reason, when Furman discovered, unquote, the glove, it still was damp with blood. I replicated this whole event exactly one year later with about the same conditions of humidity uh, and temperature at the same place where the glove was found. And the only way we could get the glove to have wet blood was to put it in the plastic bag up until we took it out and dropped it there. If you remember, Furman got there between five and six. Number two, he went alone to investigate what he said was Kalen's thump, thump, thump. Cato Kalen did mention a thump, 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 but at 10.40 p.m. That couldn't have been O.J. if he was guilty because murder was in progress starting at 10.34. So, and, and O.J. got in the limousine right at about 11 and went to the airport. Therefore, take O.J. out. Now, who else could have dropped it there? Well, I guess the killers, if they were crazy, could have taken one glove from the scene, run the risk of getting caught, identified, or even spotted by taking it to O.J.'s house, somehow getting on the premises, and putting it in an alley next to the side of his house, except why? If O.J. had a perfect alibi, for all they do, that would incriminate him. It might distract the police and cause them to investigate him very thoroughly. Third possibility is that Mark Berman, who had the biggest case of his career, by his own admission, learned that he'd been kicked off the case and replaced by two senior guys. Um, he wanted, and his record shows, he was always looking for the big arrest. He wanted to stay in that case, and he knew how he could do it. All he had to do was become a witness. You can change cops, but you can't change witnesses. Furthermore, Mark Furman admitted, in a sense, that the glove was planted in this way. On July 29th, after New York and New Yorker magazines had publicized the fact that although it wasn't brought out in the preliminary hearing that spanned June and July 4th, uh, uh, Furman was in fact a very racist fellow according to the papers in his lawsuit. And so his friend, Laura McKinney, who made the tapes, said to him, do you think this is going to get you thrown out? because they won't want you as a witness anymore. And Furman said, and this is critical, because no one had tested the glove on July 29th, wasn't tested till October, no one competent to say so could even know what type it was. Furman said, no, no. He said, this is a case about a glove. I am the glove. Without the glove, the case goes bye-bye. He knew before the testing that on that glove, the right hand of the glove, was the blood residue of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. The only way he could have known that is if he took the glove from Bundy, as he surely did, and planted it in Rockingham, and then, in violation of every police protocol taught, walked his fellow detectives three of them out one at a time to observe the glove, to cement it in their memories and to cement his place in the case. And he knew they were stuck with him. And oh, were they stuck. Oh. Do you think the prosecution, because many folks have said over the years, the prosecution could have secured a guilty verdict if they had not put Mark Furman on the stand, they could have picked other officers and folks to testify and got the glove and evidence and all that. Just not don't use Mark Furman. OJ would have been convicted. Would that have been possible? 
let me tell you, let me tell you, they explored that possibility in every way, six ways to Sunday, because they did not want to have to put that guy on the stand and admit right at the moment they put him up by reading a letter from a woman that he had offended, that he used the term nigger a lot, which is a repugnant word. It used to be commonplace when I was a kid, although I always found it to be repugnant, but uh, it, it just became part of the lexicon and Mark Furman couldn't get a sentence out without saying it. So how could they have gotten a glove in without Furman? Absolutely not. There was no way, there was no person who could say, I found this glove here and it could not be available to say, but I didn't put it there, which he couldn't have said uh, very logically if he weren't on the witness stand. So he was the linchpin of the case, what the, we called in law school the sine qua non, without which there is nothing. And he knew it, and he said so in his own voice. And I say to myself, what in the world do these redneck assholes need when the guy admits that he planted the glove and they can't see it because they don't have the intelligence? But I've got to admit, they're strong, they're out there, and I'm hoping that this book, for those who manage to secure a copy, will beat some sense into their heads because they haven't used it since. The Truth About the O.J. Simpson Trial by the Architect of the Defense, F. Lee Bailey. Uh, There's been lots of talk about the jury, even for the past 25 years and condemning them, saying that they were racist. Uh, Nine black jurors eventually uh, on the trial, 10 of them non-white, two white females uh, on the jury of 12. Uh, In her book, Marsha Clark, who was the prosecuting attorney in this case, uh, she says, and this is in October 94, so there's you all were still constructing the jury at this point. She says, I'd like to see us abolish the jury system why leave the fate of our nation in the hands of these moon rocks? Moon rocks. That's the term that she used to describe the jury. Yes, your, your thoughts? Well, Marcia Clark, Marcia Clark just is a threat to humanity, particularly since she's got a license to practice law. Fortunately, she did such a bad job with this case, and I'm not saying a good lawyer could have won it, that she hasn't tried many cases since. Nobody's wanted to hire her. And Chris Arden was brought in as Johnny Cochran complained at the last minute because it turned out that the jury box was filled with minorities. Now, to get to the reality of life and to cast aside the insulting remarks, many of them made by the press and many by responsible people, that this jury was racist motivated, once again, We have the ignoramuses of America who haven't done their homework. Three of the jurors wrote a book. They explained everything they did, everything they saw, much less than we saw on TV or live in the courtroom, and why they could not get around the fact that O.J. had no opportunity, which is the basis on which they decided the case. A couple of little inside stories. which I think humanized the jury. It was a good jury. I mean, anybody that wants to blame the result in the OJ case on the jury is grasping for straws, uncharitable, and frankly, a white supremacist. I want nothing to do with them. The jury uh, (coughs) did not, I don't think, ever consider race except for the fact that Mark Furman was to them before it was shown in cross-examining him um, that he was, in fact, a racist. And I, I think that the words of the poor lady of the jury, who was an elegant woman, by the way, and I think of her church, said to my chief investigator at a Christmas party, 
which was attended by 10 jurors in Johnny Cochran's office the Christmas after the acquittal, which was October 3rd, 1995. Uh, everybody thought that the jury had mesmerized Johnny Cochran. They liked him a lot. Everybody likes Johnny Cochran. But they were really offended by his little act with, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And putting on the blue hat, found at the scene during his final argument. I love John Acock. He's one of the best friends I ever had. I loved trying a case with him. Those tactics just didn't win the day. Well, my investigator uh, couldn't restrain himself. And he said, well, um, what did you people think of Mr. Bailey? She said, we loved Mr. Bailey, but we didn't need Mr. Bailey. And then Pat said, why is that? She said, we knew Furman was a liar the minute he opened his mouth. So they didn't have to have me show them. And I took that as a strong jury, independently minded. They knew where the focus was going to be in this case. They knew who they were going to have to believe uh, in order to get across that chasm from not guilty to guilty. And their eyes were riveted on Mark Furman who I must tell you at first blush, tall, handsome, fair-haired, uh, until he begins to spew, as I heard on the tapes, when he gave his opinion, by the way, not just of black people. He hated Jews, every bit as much, and said so. Here's a man who had a little Christmas tree in his house. The only ornaments on it were stainless steel swastika. How did a sicko like that ever get a badge in the LAPD. And how many more are out there? Somebody protected him. That means at least one. Context of white supremacy. Uh, I see we had some folks who dialed in. I just wanted to get a quick word from you, uh, Mr. Bailey, on <clears throat> Christopher Darden. Uh, you just mentioned him, black male. He was uh, co-prosecutor with Marsha Clark in this case. Uh, everybody wrote a book. Uh, we're getting yours as well. Uh, in Darden's book, In Contempt, uh, he talks about a, a particular exchange with the two of you. He says uh, that you told him, we're going to kick your asses. He responds, I turned to see F. Lee Bailey grinning at me. Pardon me. We're going to kick your asses. You mean figuratively, I hope. He just stood there, that smug look on his jolly face. Well, I said, be sure and bring some help. That was the F. Lee Bailey I had come to know. A foul-mouthed, arrogant SOB. Nothing but an attack dog waiting ignoring the rest of the trial, taking sips from a tiny thermos. Bailey hated me. I thought, wow, that is so direct. What was your relationship with Mr. Darden, and did you hate him? No, I didn't, and he made that up. Uh, you know, Christopher Darden is a guy who can't find work in the trial court. I don't know if anybody's hired him since this case. He was brought in after the jury was impaneled to put a black person at the prosecution table. Johnny Cochran, and I don't say that lightly, brought a motion to have him excluded as the prosecution's attempt at tokenism. And Judge Ito let him say, but I'll tell you about Christopher Darden's story that he can't deny. And it shows him to be much too much of a sucker to be out there practicing law. When the right-handed glove was put on the evidence table, frankly, we at the defense had not seen it, not paid enough attention to it, might have been able to blow the case out right there if we had been prepared to show that the interior, the lining of the glove, didn't have any DNA from OJ. And I took a look at it. I've got a size nine hand, pretty average for a guy who's five, nine, or thereabouts. And I thought, that's too small for me. And OJ's hands are huge. He didn't go all those years in the NFL without fumbling more than once or twice because he was a pansy. He could get his hands right around the football. Remind me a little bit of my hero, Sweetwater Clifton, and the Harlem Globetrotters. 
Sweetwater could dribble the ball without ever letting it go. OJ was kind of the same way. So I said to myself, myself, these people already know that glove won't fit OJ. Let's see if we can bring it home with a little bit of verb. So it was a recess. The witness was the president of the golf company who really didn't know anything about the case, not a whole lot. I didn't think about his company, but I sidled over to Chris Darden, who had a hot temper and would always take the bait. And Chris would always ask me, because we sat next to each other, after he examined the witness or argued a motion or did virtually anything in the courtroom other than Burke, to give him a grade. And he always suggested I give him an A. And I always gave him a C or a C minus. And we had this little bit of fun rivalry going. So I sidled over to Chris and I said, and I apologize to your listeners, but this is exactly what I said. I said, Chris, you know, you're a good shit, but you've got the balls of a stud field mouse. And Darden came out of his seat. Uh, I thought the smoke was coming out of his ears. How could you say such a thing? about poor me. Uh, I said, well, if you look at that glove as I'm doing, you know as well as I know that it won't fit O.J. Simpson. So if you don't have the guts to make him try it on, I might. Darden took the bait. The minute Trajito came back in the courtroom, he caught him halfway up the little set of special stairs they had built for him to get to the bench because Trajito was a man of very modest height. And he said, uh, Your Honor, Mr. Bailey just told me something. And this is on the record. And I want the defendant to try on the glove. Nobody saw it coming. Johnny said, You mean in front of the jury? You crazy? And he just said, Fine. Well, the rest is history. I left the courtroom. It wasn't my witness. But on the radio on the way home, I heard that the trial had just imploded. And the newsmen were saying for the first time, there's the trial had opened, gee, maybe he's going to win. And Darden got canned, rehired. I mean, the stories about what happened to him that night are rampant, but it certainly enabled him to make a fool out of himself. And if that was the work of a cruel and arrogant SOB lawyer, well told, my friend, well told. <laughs> F. Lee Bailey, the cows. Uh, let's see. Can we now be a question? Uh, let's see. Some of our listeners have been studying this for the first time and were super excited to uh, know you were coming on the program. Do you mind taking a, a question from a caller or two? Fire away. I've been taking questions all my life and asking <laughs> one here and there. At love asking questions. Uh, Red in Ohio, did you have a question for Mr. F. Lee Bailey? Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I can. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking my call. Hello, everyone. Hello, Mr. Bailey. Where are you I'll try home, to. Um, I'm sorry? Where are you in Ohio? Central Ohio. Central Ohio. Okay, is that near Mansfield, Columbus? It's near Columbus. Okay, the reason I ask is because that's one of my favorite states. Many would say that's where I got my start in the Shepherd case in Cleveland. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead and put your question. I know, it's fine. Um, so I'm trying to make this quick because I'm actually, I am actually finished reading uh, Mr. Cuban's book, and now I'm starting on Mark Furman's book. So um, it's really interesting. A lot of the things that you're saying, he contradicts, uh, Mark Furman contradicts in his book, and then also Cuban does too. Uh, so I guess the first thing that I would ask, because in Mark Furman's book, he has a foreword um, by Vincent Bugalosi. And yes, as far as like, addressing his racism, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the last name, but he was saying that if Furman had done all of the, the racist acts that P. 
people assume that he has done, then why weren't there more people, like especially after the case and he became um, more well-known, how come there weren't people coming out and uh, challenging or, you know, challenging like any case that he was a, he was involved in? And what would you say to that? All right. The, the answer is because Herman had been complained of on many occasions and the LAPD never did anything about it. So a person who might think of coming forward after these tapes were revealed would be very fearful that they were going to turn around and attack him. Kind of the way Mr. Trump attacks everybody who disagrees with him. Um, they were prepared to do that on behalf of Thurman. And the reason was not uh, strictly, let's say, out of affection. If Furman had been tabbed with a lot of the things he did and civil suits had been filed, it would have cost the LAPD a lot of money, just as the Rodney King case cost them a barrel full because of the poor grade of their police officers. Uh, okay. Before you get to your next um, question, Rick, okay. the- I just wanted to ask, wasn't there a suit settled which involved Furman allegedly planting evidence on a black suspect during the trial? Did that happen, Mr. Bailey? That's exactly correct. Uh, a saw named Britton testified that a knife attributed to him when Furman arrested him and shot him a couple of times had been planted. It wasn't his at all. We were going to put Britain on the stand to testify against Furman that he was a liar who planted evidence. And they came around and paid him $100,000 and Judge Ito would let him testify because he had described the cop who shot him at one point as being a redhead, which was pretty flimsy legal ruling, but Rajito, I'm sorry to say, who could not very well ignore the fact that he shared a pillow every night with the highest ranking woman police officer in LAPD, Judge Ito consciously or subconsciously tended to tilt when he could the rulings for the prosecution. Let me hasten to say, Gus, that no lawyer I've ever met was good enough to have won the Simpson case as a prosecutor unless he were up against pretty inexperienced opposition. Not a mountain of evidence. Sorry for interrupting your uh, questions, Red in Ohio. Proceed. Okay. Um, I guess I'll just make this the last question. I know that uh, you have made mention of like the glove and how Furman was saying that he didn't plant the glove. And in the book, um, because I'm only about a quarter of the way through in his book, he said it wasn't just the glove. So at the, if I'm not mistaken, that rock at the Rockingham house, he said there was um, some coins that weren't tested at the Bundy house. uh, The because he, he, in his book, he was saying Van Adder and Lang, they weren't actually uh, preserving evidence correctly. And when the, when the Bronco should have been impounded, it, it wasn't. So lots of things could have been contaminated and not just by him. But he had said that there were coins there and not all the blood was collected. And then switching over to Tubin's book, he was saying that the prosecution didn't even test any of the of the blood evidence so is that is that true do you do you recall like there being lots of blood that may have just been like photographed but it wasn't actually um, collected he had also in Furman's book he had made mention of like blood on the bottom like door part of the bronco on the handle on now mind you this is all the stuff that he found and he did also mention in his book when he was talking to some of the other detectives whenever he would say oh i found something else they were like oh not again so i kind of wanted to get yeah. your your take on that and i'll mute my line thank you yeah. um, red and i must tell you the last time i had lunch in downtown Cleveland, i had at a restaurant named red and i loved it so <clears throat> if the owner is listening tonight 
Good luck to him. I'll be back. If you look in retrospect, Marcia Clark wrote a book. She blamed it on the detectives for not doing a good job. The detectives wrote a book. They blamed it on her for being incompetent. Herman writes the book. He blames it on everybody for not getting a conviction. And Tubin writes a book telling us what he thinks he heard in the courtroom when he's not busy jollying himself. Jeffrey Tubin is history. And if you put any stock in what he said, go watch the videotape. As OJ said, when he heard about the incident, he said at least Pee Wee Herman rendered a theater. But, you know, we're stuck with, with the people who show up. Thank God for those of you who still love journalism. Linda Deutsch, one of the finest reporters ever to grace the newspapers, covered that trial beginning to end. Whatever Linda said, you can take as gospel, even if you find some of my statements for those of others to be questionable. Wow. Much obliged, uh, Red in Ohio. I <laughs> wanted to make sure I had to get in. To your knowledge, is the O.J. Simpson criminal trial, is that the first time that the phrase the race card was used? Is that the first time that that phrase was invoked? No, I wrote a book in 1977 called 75 called For the Defense, in which I detail a case where I personally was a defendant, but I also did the cross-examination. And I caught a racist on the stand. This case was centered in South Carolina. Um, and I had some witnesses that he didn't realize were witnesses until I said, you know, you say you're not a racist, but you've got an employee named Jimmy James. And uh, that's right. And I said, and you call him a nigger every day, don't you? And he looked around and said, oh, my Lord, they've got all the witnesses. He said, yes, I do. And he enjoys it. So this is my second encounter with that word. Wow. No, I mean, the race card, did they did they accuse you of playing in the, the race card in that case, too? Well, the judge called me up to the bench. He said, it's very unfortunate that you raised that. I said, you bet, Judge. Unfortunate for anyone who's hoping for a conviction. And I looked him in the eye like he was dirt. Huh. Wow. Wow. Needless to, needless to say, they didn't get one of we might not be doing this show. <laughs> wow. Be before I... Uh let you enjoy the rest of your evening. I wanted to ask the the FX series was so popular and that talk about thinking OJ is guilty, like psh, no doubt about it. He absolutely did it. If you watch the FX series, uh, which is based on Tubin's book, but it seems yeah. like a major point uh, of that 10 episode uh, program is, you know, poor Marsha Clark, she was a victim of sexism. You had all this toxic masculinity. OJ is a spouse abusing killer. And you've got all these males who ridicule her about her, her child care problems. Uh, it's just total toxic masculinity and patriarchy. Uh, and poor Marsha Clark. Uh, what, what did you make of kind of how it portrayed her? Let me tell you something. Don't ever waste time thinking poor Marsha Clark. She was vicious. She called me a liar in open court. If she'd been male, uh, I might have rearranged her a bit. Uh, she had the vocabulary of a tank commander. And uh, she, I think, sidled up to everybody on the defense team but Robert Shapiro. I know uh, Johnny Cochran's wife almost slugged her one day because she was sidling up to Johnny Cochran. So... Marcia Clark got several million dollars for a book that wasn't worth the paper it was written on. Don't cry for her, Argentina. Wow. The book, uh, The Truth About the O.J. Simpson Trial by the Architect of the Defense. Uh, we will be looking forward to adding that one to the library. I mean, if we started with Jeffrey Tubin, definitely have to get better books uh, on the trial. 
Uh, it has been a hoot having you on the program, Mr. Bailey. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of your uh, Wednesday evening with us. Uh, we will keep reading and we'll be looking out for your book, encouraging other folks to get it as well. Gus, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Mr. Bailey. Take excellent care, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to speak to you again soon. Indeed. Evening, Mr. Bailey. Thank you so much, and take care. Uh, Bye-bye now, Gus. Context of white supremacy, the architect of the defense team, F. Lee Bailey. Man, oh man, I would have never thought if you had talked to me in some earlier points in life where I was totally sure OJ did it. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Like, he is guilty. Uh, I would not have thought, like, wow, I'll be talking to someone from the OJ defense team and actually thinking, nah, no way. OJ didn't do it. (laughs) Like, that would have just sounded crazy. I was even, as I was preparing for the program today, I was even thinking, like, man, I used to think it was crazy for someone to say that. Mark Furman planted a glove on O.J. Simpson. I used to think that was absurd. <laughs> like, what do you mean? I'm going to give you a quick guide to the future, Gus. Yes, sir. If if my client gets convicted or acquitted by a jury and I keep talking about the case, that means I think he's innocent because I would not waste my time talking up the case mm. for a guilty person. If he wins, that's a system, but I don't want any part of them after that. Mm. That's and OJ, OJ, I'm very proud to call a good friend. Mm. This is for 25 years. That's a good point, too, because you've been you said from from day one, you thought he was innocent. Like at no point you've not wavered. And eh, I don't know about this choose fella. Maybe he did. You said pretty consistently for 25 years. He didn't do it. Sticking to it. The evidence timeline, everything. He absolutely didn't do it. Is that correct? Well, with one exception, you said pretty consistently. The word is absolutely. Mm. Never, never a doubt in my mind. I told the press on the Friday before the Monday verdict, and again that evening as I entered the jail, there's an acquittal, two acquittals in the envelopes. You guys can sit and play games with yourselves and interview each other all night long, but you can't change what's in the envelope. Minutes later, I sat with my client inside the jail to tell him I felt very strongly we had it knocked. He had a grin on his face as wide as a Cheshire cat could ever have. And I said, OJ, apparently you know something good too from a different source. He said, you bet your ass. Everybody wants to have their photo taken with me and an autograph because they're telling me they're never going to see me again. And they know what's in the envelope. And they wouldn't be saying that if they didn't know I was going home. Wow. What, that's part of it because the jury deliberated so quickly. You t- that's how you said part of how you knew, oh, yeah, we got an acquittal. We won this one. People say, see, they didn't even take it seriously. They just went in there and said, oh, we're going to let him go. Uh, you know, he's a black person and we're not going to convict a black person. We're not even going to take the time to dignify the deaths of Nicole Brown Simpson, Ron Goldman. Nah, we're just going to let him go because he's a black person. What, what do you make of that? That's absolute nonsense. Nobody in the jury ever thought that way. If they thought he'd killed his wife, they'd have shot him away for life, which is the most you can get for second degree. But look, the people that don't take the time to do their homework does have the loudest voices at the end of the day, the most empty voices. They're all over the country right now saying that our election was a fraud. Well, the people who are saying that are fraudulent because they know better, except for maybe the guy at the top who is too sick to know that he lost the election. He may think he's won it and he should go with the Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland and enjoy the rest of his days somewhere else. Get the hell out of our hair. 
Now, if you think I'm a Republican, you're wrong. If you think I'm a Democrat, you're wrong. If you think I'm a guy who would like to see somebody who knew what he was doing take the helm of government, then you would be right. Hmm. Hmm. What, since we I neglected to get this in, you did mention uh, there were two Tom Langs in this case, uh, Detective Lang, uh, the other Tom Lang, who you all were going to bring as a witness. Uh, could you just share about some of his testimony for folks who may have missed out and since he didn't get to appear at the trial? Yeah. Tom Lang, the neighbor, lived probably three doors down the street from Nicole. He got home from a weekend somewhere. 10 o'clock at night, he took his dog out for a walk. As he walked up Bundy Street toward the intersection of Dorothy, right close to Nicole's condo, he saw a white Ford F-350 with two guys in the truck and another guy standing out in front of her entrance gate on the sidewalk in what he called a menacing crouch. And Tom Lang was a contractor and a successful one. And... Uh, So he didn't think much of it. He didn't want his dog. He thought there was going to be trouble of some kind. Didn't want his dog to get caught up in the trouble. So he turned left on Dorothy Street and went a different way. Next day, he looked in the paper and realized that he had seen the woman who had been murdered a short time later. He wrote a letter to us in the defense uh, because O.J. had already been named or as a suspect. He wrote a letter to the police department. He later sat down with his lawyer and gave a Q&A on tape. His testimony was impenetrable. We couldn't use him or OJ or other critical defense witnesses because we were down to two spare jurors. And had we gone to 11 jurors, Marsha Clark would have gotten a mistrial and started everything over again. And we couldn't afford that. We knew we had the case won, and we were out of money big time. That's so important. That's so important. They For years, I've heard that for years, uh, so many folks have complained, particularly white people, and saying that, see, O.J. Simpson just used all this money, and he outspent the prosecution, and they just piled up. They had this huge team of lawyers and attorneys, and they totally overwhelmed uh, the prosecution. Can you respond to that, people saying that you all had more money and resources? Um, Number one, we didn't. O.J., I think, had $6 million when he met Bob Shapiro, made another $3 million from his book written during the trial. Uh, I lost about 550000 in that case. I never got paid. Johnny got some money. Shapiro grabbed most of it, and the expenses were absolutely ridiculous. I mean, we had these, all these guys from New York and Boston flying out there on a regular basis just to have conferences. We should have had Zoom in those days. But, Gus, I've got uh, another call coming in in about three minutes. So I'm going to have to call it a night. It's been my pleasure. I hope to get to talk to you again. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Bailey. Take care. Okay, bye. Be well.